I'm Steve Eglash. I'm the moderator for this panel. I'm also executive director of data science research programs at Stanford. We've got, we've got a terrific group of panelists here today for this discussion. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear from each of them in a moment, then we'll get into some questions that we've prepared up here, and then we'll ask all of you for questions as well. So, so what do we mean by clean energy or sustainable energy? When we're talking about sustainability, we're trying to talk about living our lives in a way that doesn't in any way hamper or compromise the ability of future generations to live their lives with a comparable or even better standard of living. And that's what we're trying to talk about when we're talking about clean energy. It's fundamentally a very large scale problem, as we all know, and so it requires solutions of scale. And you can see on the slide here some of the topics that our panelists will touch on today. We're gonna to talk about it in a way that allows you to make money and do things that are good business and also are good for the planet. And what all of our panelists have in common and the reason that they're here today is they're doing innovative technology in this area and they're translating it into profitable business opportunities. We'll talk about the role of fundamental science and how you match that to practical world opportunities. We'll talk about the way that researchers and financiers and people in corporations are working together. I hope that we'll talk not only about innovative technologies, but also innovative business models. And I believe our panelists will take a worldwide view and talk not only about opportunities in the developed world, but in the developing world as well, uh, where after all, that's where we have uh, five or six billion of the world's people over the next couple of decades. So I understand that uh, in, I, I'm delighted by the way we're talking about uh, energy innovation. I understand there were some uh, skeptics around the current state of energy innovation. And you know, skepticism in the face of uh, innovation is an undeniable reality. And history has shown us time and time again that the doubters are perennial every time there's been great innovation and great changes inevitably prove those skeptics wrong. Today's no different. Uh, we've all heard what the skeptics say. Uh, we've heard them say that at present it's a luxury for the wealthy and it, uh, it won't, and it's will probably uh, fall in the future, but it never come into as common use as today's uh, um, status quo. It's practically reached the limit of its development. No improvements of a radical nature have been introduced. We've heard him say it's not for the new, near future, in spite of the many rumors to that effect. We've heard him say it's only a novelty, it's a fad. Now, what's most interesting about these critiques is that they weren't made about solar, they weren't made about wind, they weren't made about energy storage. They weren't, in fact, made over the last few years. They were made over 100 years ago around another disruption, another innovation poised to disrupt a different centuries old technology. It was the horseless carriage that was the luxury for the wealthy. It was the automobile that reached the limit of its development in 1909, by the way that comment was from. In, uh, in 1899, it was the roads devoted to motor cars that was not for the near future. And it was the, uh, in 1903, it was the no automobile that was only a novelty, a fad. Now, today, of course, absurd to think of that way about the automobile, mistaking it as the novelty of that, but 100 years ago, the emergence of the automobile wasn't as clear, and with an incumbent technology that had dominated transportation for thousands of years, of course, the horse. Now, today, the automobile is undergoing a similar type of disruption, uh, a similar kind of transformation yet again. It's around electric vehicles, and it's just one of the many sectors experiencing the kind of profound innovation we're gonna talk about. Uh, the energy innovation Industry today is at an inflection point, ready to power the 21st century in different ways, to be, as, as Steve was saying, clean and secure, cheap and reliable. And we have the opportunity now to take innovation against this, what we think of as this desert of innovation historically, uh, to define the energy ecosystem for generation to come. And the real opportunity is to be part of that movement before the skeptics change their tune. Uh, that, in the end, of course, is what real innovation is all about. The great Alan Kay quote, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. That's exactly what great energy entrepreneurs are doing today. It's exactly what Richard and Steve 
are experiencing every day in the Stanford community, and I look forward to discussing more of that on this panel. Thank you. I'm going to talk about two very important uh, issues, number one and number two. Yes, piss and shit. Uh, so we're going to talk shit this morning briefly in my two minutes. And I know it's not enough time to talk about shit. It's a topic that most males are comfortable with from an early age on, uh, even uh, beyond uh, normal adulthood. Uh, we're investigating uh, with the help of the Gates Foundation. Our primary benefactor at this point is Bill Gates and certainly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring sanitation to the developing world. And the program is, is entitled uh, Reinvent the Toilet Challenge. It's not so much the toilet that you may sit on or squat on or the urinal that you may pee in, but what we do uh, with the products that are discharged on a daily basis in the developing world. Uh, in the slide on the upper left-hand side, you see ladies who are taking water, their daily supply of water uh, from uh, electric pump wells. But if you look off to the right in that uh, panel, you'll see an open defecation field. So people in India, uh, elsewhere in uh, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Africa prefer to do their daily elimination outdoors because the so-called modern technology for the developing world is a pit latrine, uh, which is horrendously stinky. Uh, so we wanted to, uh, with the aid of the Gates Foundation, develop uh, a aspirational toilet system that's independent of any urban infrastructure as we know it. Uh, we have a variety of technologies, uh, high-tech technologies that are interwoven into our prototype toilets. Uh, you can see two examples, one that uh, handles about 100 people per day. It's a normal flush toilet, uh, a toilet room uh, generated by uh, Kohler in our collaborative effort. Uh, on the lower uh, left-hand side, you actually see a prototype uh, in our joint venture manufacturing company uh, in China near Shanghai. Uh, we will soon be uh, producing roughly 300 units for South Africa in simply one district, they need 7,000 units. Uh, and you can see the treatment side uh, of our system. Essentially, we convert shit and pee into energy. And we clean up the water, it looks like drinking water. Uh, if you're courageous, you could actually uh, drink our product water. Uh, and then we convert uh, the gaseous products uh, back into electricity. And of course, uh, solar panels or uh, m more high-tech uh, PV uh, collection systems can be used to drive the system. So we have absolutely no discharges from our system. We generate water, which can be used for a variety of uh, purposes in the developing world. I'm going to talk about the, our new opportunity, what we have for energy storage applications, especially for lithium-ion batteries. So recently, we have discovered that we can recover really highly value-added carbon composite powders from recycled tires for lithium-ion batteries. So we have a tire rubber meets the road with new OR and technology for battery manufacturing. So what typically people do is you take the recycled tires, you pulver, first you just crumble into pieces, pulverize this into powders. So they take the powders and pyrolyze and make oil, gas, and uh, low value char. What we have done is we have developed a sulfonation process. You take this crumb rubber or the tire powders, you go through the sulfonation followed by pyrolysis, so you can recover up to 50% yield of carbon composite powders from recycled tires. And we have already demonstrated in the form of uh, coin cells right now, and the performance is equal or better than graphite anodes in lithium ion batteries. So just recall in lithium ion batteries, graphites are used as anodes and the cathode you are coupling with lithium, nickel, cobalt, uh, manganese oxide along with the organic electrolytes. So what we are doing is you can just recover the carbon composites from the recycled tires and you can replace it, form fit replacement of graphite in anode batteries. So if you what we have done is we have actually recovered the morphology and tailored the microstructure from recycled tires and demonstrated its feasibilities. 
So right now, 290 million scrap tires are generated in the United States since 2003, every year. So the most of the tires are sent to landfills, used to fillers in plastics, rubbers, and asphalt, as even artificial turfs. Like three weeks ago, NBC had a real article the, on uh, artificial, all these uh, turfs with the recycled uh, tire crumbs are really dangerous and cancerous. So what we have is we are using the waste tires for products such as energy storage. It's really attractive because we can recover the carbon materials and also we can uh, uh, control the environmental hazard produced by all these uh, waste stockpiles and crumb rubber. And we have added a value-added product. And with this product, you can actually reduce the cost of the batteries by 10% right now. You can just take the powders. So we have done it in small scale, and we want to do it large scale. So we are licensing our technology to industries so that we can take it to the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk today about what I wanted to call the next low-hanging fruit for building energy savings. Uh, the kind of work that we do at, in my group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is very much on the deployment side of the spectrum, but it also looks at emerging technologies and how we can transition them into the marketplace. Um, so I believe that the buildings industry is really starting to position itself to unlock the potential for much deeper energy savings opportunities, and I believe that for a number of reasons. One is that utilities emerging technologies programs are getting squeezed by energy codes. We get progressively more aggressive, more aggressive energy codes, and they tend to be um, administered prescriptively, meaning you have to have more and more efficient air conditioning units or more and more efficient lamps, like LEDs and that kind of thing. They're finding it harder to say to their customers, here's an opportunity for energy savings. If you think about it from this widget-based perspective, we're running out of opportunities for more cost-effective, lower energy air conditioning units. So they're starting to look for other opportunities. In addition, we have disclosure laws enabling across different cities across the country, um, making energy use transparent and tying it to asset value for buildings. So we have, from the owner's perspective, uh, really um, almost public knowledge about how buildings are doing and uh, an owner motivator for them to do better. So we also, at the same time, have a, a suite of new facilities, methods, and, and testing means at our disposal to enable us to look at different types of energy technologies and adopt them into the building technologies marketplace. So one example is a facility that I manage at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called Flex Lab, which was specifically designed to test integrated building systems, getting away from this widget-based approach and thinking about buildings more as holistic systems. How do we design a lighting system coupled with a shading system so that it's controlled together to save energy, both lighting energy but also cooling energy, and do so comfortably? So really there's a bigger opportunity for market share and, and energy savings when we get these lighting companies and shading companies talking to each other and working together and developing new technologies and protocols for the consumer to be able to adopt. Um, so integrated systems are an untapped market opportunity. Uh, technologies that enable simple cost-effective controls to happen across systems I think is a new emerging field um, that is relatively untapped and that some, a few handful of technology uh, companies out there are starting to look at, but it really is a new area I think for people to look at sort of these plug-and-play opportunities for say an HVAC system to talk to a, lighting, uh, a shading system. If a room's unoccupied, why condition it and have the shade all the way up if it's in cooling mode? Why not put the shade down and make the room uh, cooler right off the bat. So there's opportunities like that. We also have an environment where there's a lot more um, engagement in terms of real-time energy management and looking at grid integration opportunities. So what are the ways that we can do demand response and have uh, building technologies work with the grid to lower demand on, on the grid? So utilities are very motivated to look at these types of enabled communications opportunities at the systems level. This is yet another motivator, I think, for the building technologies industry to start developing these communication and controls protocols that enable us to save more energy.